Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden and our daughter Jennifer. This is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study where we go through the Bible on a chapter by chapter basis and give you your whole Bible back. Doing expositional Bible study contrasted to topical Bible study. Today we are studying <coughs> Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30. Good morning, Cynthia. Hi, Cynthia. The Louisiana contingency <laughs> always gets here first in Thanks the quick. chat room for the broadcast. <laughs> Proverbs 30. Are you obligated to honor your parents? Some people, that's a, a simple answer. To other others, it's a little more complicated than that. In chapter 30 of Proverbs, we find a concluding compilation of wisdom sayings by Solomon under the pseudonym Agur, the son of Jacka. Among other things, Solomon warns not to add to the sayings of God, or we will be found out to be liars. He also sharply warns us not to dishonor our parents. We know that the scripture teaches us to honor mother and father, but are we exempted from this? when our parents are in error or in sin? That's a real common response. So many scriptures, and talking about not adding to the scriptures, you'll take a verse of scripture, but then you add a caveat after it. You honor your mother and father unless uh, your mother is an axe murderer. Or, you know, you, um, you believe all things are possible unless it's not something that God wants you to have. Uh, we add these caveats to the scripture. We, we rationalize away what God is actually saying. Uh, in the area of honoring your parents, many people have been born into abusive, neglectful situations, and they might feel that they cannot honor their parents because of circumstances of their upbringing. Is that a justifiable position? If God does require us to honor mother and father, then on what basis is this carried out at times when parents are harsh and cruel and you've suffered in your childhood? We're going to look into that in our study today. We'll begin Proverbs 30, verses 1 through 33. Uh, the first section, verse 1 through verse 10, please. Okay, the words of Agur, the son of Jecha, even the prophecy the man spake unto Ithiel, even to unto Ithiel and Eucal. Surely I am more brutish than any man, and have not understanding of man. I learn neither I neither learn wisdom nor have the knowledge of the holy. Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fists? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou, shalt, and thou be found a liar. Two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Deny me not them before I die. Remove far from me the vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food convenient for me. Does that speak of convenience stores and quick fast foods? <laughs> I don't think so. Lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. Accuse not a servant unto his master, lest he curse thee and thou be found guilty. So verse 9 seems to be championing the cause of the middle class. Don't let me be below the poverty line lest I curse God. Don't let me live out above, the, you know, in the 1% lest I uh, say, well, who is God that I should need him? And if you think about it, there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, it astounds me. People such as uh, Bill Gates, uh, people that are celebrities that have that live in the top 1% of the economic strata of the Western world, many of them, a great share of them are atheists. They just feel they have no need 
uh, of God. And then people that live in uh, grinding poverty, they have great uh, uh, aversion to God. They're angry at God because they feel like things could be different. The idea of a loving God escapes them because of the rigors of their circumstances. So Solomon's championing the middle class here. Uh, in Proverbs 30, we do find at the beginning a reference to a contributor other than Solomon, who was Agur, the son of Jacob. Well, you kind of get an idea in that you don't find that those names anywhere else in the Bible, and you actually won't find them in ancient cultures. Some scholars, based on breakdown of the name, suggest that it's actually a pseudonym that Solomon is using. The phrase Agur, the son of Jacka, means one who is without sin, who bore the yoke of the Lord. Others suggest that Agur was a wise man from the east, a Gentile contributor of the Proverbs compiled in chapter 30. In rabbinical literature, there's a reference. Now, if you want to, I like to always compare what the rabbis have believed by going, there's a website called Kabad.org. It's C-H-A-B-A-D dot org. And you have to kind of take it with a grain of salt. There are some people that they'll go back to Jewish references and, and they take that as like a superimposed level of authority. That there's how we look at it from our perspective, but we they lend more weight to a Jewish perspective. Well, uh, I understand that, but let's not forget that they're Christ rejectors. Let's not forget that they absolutely, totally reject Jesus as Messiah. Mm -hmm. And uh, that doesn't mean they're not his people. Listen to what I'm saying, what I'm not saying. But at the same time, to look back, here's a perfect example, something you can research and, and find at Kabod.org about when uh, Adam gave names to all the animals. I get a lot of, uh, you know, people look at, the Bible through these Coke bottle glasses of their religious tradition. And I have people, because we're in prophetic ministry, they say, well, where do you see personal prophecy in the Bible? <laughs> so I decided to go through the Bible and start finding it. And I didn't have to go any further than Adam, where it says Adam gave names to all the animals. And if you look up that word up, it, it implies that he prophesied over them. And then I dug a little deeper. And on kebab.org, I found that the rabbis for millennia had believed that what Adam actually did was he spoke by the spirit of prophecy over every single animal. And that's not all they believed. We won't even get into all that. But, uh, and so right there, uh, you find personal prophecy. And so there, it's, it's interesting to get a deeper historical context of these things as we study them. Uh, Rabbinical literature suggests, in reference to the pseudonyms uh, that Sol Solomon seems to be using, that he is a compiler of wisdom literature in the light of the contradiction of his own life regarding being led astray by multiple foreign wives, as, as though he, he adopted this pseudonym as a form of self-justification of people that were looking at what he said contrasting it by what he did and saying, you know, what's the problem here? How can you say this? Uh, whichever the case, uh, we accept the chapter as canon and consider its verses placed there by the hand of God as an infallible writ handed down to us. Uh, the, you say, well, do you believe the Bible's in, infallible? Yes, I do. I believe the autographs, the original manuscripts, of which we have none, that was a big surprise to me. I didn't find that out until I became an adult, began to study and found out that we do not have in our possession any of the original manuscripts or what the technical term is, the autographs. And what we have are myriads of fragments. Think about a document. Say if you took the phone book, you dropped it into a shredder, and then you took the shredded uh, pieces and put it through a shredder again and then scattered them over a thousand square miles and left them for a thousand years and then uh, archaeologists went and began to, to seek out all those little shreds and begin to put them together you get an idea of what the lion's share of what how these things have come down to us from antiquity and that really challenges 
people. And it makes them very, very uncomfortable. And then we have to think about it, much of it being written in, in Hebrew, the New Testament being written in Greek, or in the, the major minor prophets written in Aramaic, and then being translated, and then handed down as manuscripts that decayed and uh, became tattered and torn and copied and copied and copied and copied and copied. And you wonder about the quality of what we of what we have. The translations, regardless of the guy I heard preach that the authorized version, the King James Version, is the one that Jesus and the disciples used. Every other version is a perversion. Uh, I heard a Come guy on. preach that with all sincerity. Wow. Uh, but uh, uh, the translations are, are uh, quite imperfect. But yet I believe in the inspired word of God in its original form, written in the autographs, the men that actually penned them, I believe it was handed down as the infallible, perfect word of God. And not only infallible, but applicable. I think it's wrong to dismiss the Old Testament and just do away with it. There are people that completely reject the sayings of Paul. Uh, Martin Luther, he rejected the book of James. Uh, I believe, for the most part, that... Uh, the 66 books of the Bible, as we have them, were actually a, a as a list, existed in the library of Philemon, who was, um, uh, uh, we know the story about him, and Philemon and Onesimus in the, in the scriptures. Actually, it was um, Onesimus, uh, who was a bishop, and, and his, had a friend by the name of Polycarp, and between the two of them, in the late first century, they had a shared library that included all of the books that we now consider part of our Bible. That really throws people when they begin to research that. Uh, for me, I delight to study it, but it doesn't shift or change my commitment to the Word of God. And that's something that's very much assaulted, assaulted by neglect more than anything else, because we don't like in a rational society, in a seeker-sensitive uh, religious climate, where we don't want to put too much pressure on the people because they're the consumers of uh, content of ministry of which we are the producers. We don't want to put too much of a demand upon people to, to regarding this. And so we, by neglect, we've allowed the concept of the infallible word of God to be diluted and to be diminished. We need to correct that in our thinking. Um, now, the chapter begins by ascribing wisdom to God and observing how ineffable or past finding out the depths of God's wisdom treasuries really are to mere mortal men like you and I. Nevertheless, however lofty the wisdom of God is, every word, according to verse 5, is a pure word and is a, and is a shield, according to verse 5, to those who put their trust in it. In other words, just because you don't understand, it is not your understanding of the word that is a shield and a strength to you. Just because you don't understand some of what God is saying does not mean we're not a, in, accountable for it or incapable of trusting in the word, whether we think it applies to our situation or makes sense or not. How many of us have ever read something that doesn't make sense to us in the Bible? Hello. And see, in a rationalist society... There's this unwritten law that if we don't understand it, we're not accountable. Is that true? Just because we don't understand it, does that mean we're not accountable? No. Or just because we don't understand it, does that mean it's not a shield to us? See, you have to make a, a transaction of faith that gets past your rationale. Otherwise, your intellect sits as God over God. Yeah. Your intellect, like the scripture says, sits in the seat of where only God should sit. It's the abomination of desolation of he who sits in the temple declaring himself to be God who is no God. Well, that one who sits in the temple, that's you. That's the, you are that temple. And the one that sits in your temple declaring himself to be God is your rationale that will not submit to God unless God explains himself to you or draws a conclusion that you're not accountable for that, which you don't understand. No. That is absolutely wrong. And that is absolutely a rationalistic a Western mindset that does not line up. It may be a, a core component of Christian culture, but it is not reflective of the body of Scripture. And God is not judging us according to the components of Christian culture, whether we're good little Christians. He's judging us according to his word. We're answering to him according to his word. 
Verse 6 goes on to warn us not to add to the words of God, lest we come under his reproof and be found a liar. Now, we could have a big, long discussion about that. Uh, no one would be fooled by someone adding to the 66 books of the canon. What are some of the examples, however, whereby we do add to the Word of God? We add to the Word of God when we add qualifying suppositions to make them palatable to our own thinking. For instance, in John 15, 7, Jesus said, Ask what you will and it shall be done. To which we add, but only if it's something you actually need because God won't answer your wants. He will only answer your legitimate needs. Nah. <laughs> That's adding to the word of God. Mm -hmm. if, if we made some of the unqualified faith statements that Jesus made, unless Jesus had made them first, we would be considered heretics. How dare you suggest that all things are, are possible with God? The only things that are possible are the things that God wants to do. And if you ask God about something and you have a first check with him, well, what makes you think God's going to answer that? For me, the fear of God is not that he won't answer my prayers, but that he will. Because <laughs> you know, if you don't understand the covenantal nature of God, see, uh, God will, uh, add in, there are many unqualified faith statements in the scripture and specifically in the words of Jesus that we add religious caveats to, exceptions to, in order, like, here's some of those that lurk in our thinking. God only helps those who help themselves. God will, will not help you out of the problem that you get yourself into, to which I would reply, is there any other kind? No way. If God <laughs> only helps you out of the situation that you didn't create, then nobody can be saved. There's an implication is that he's kind of obligated to save you because you didn't get yourself in an unsaved condition. Therefore, he's taking responsibility. No, I'm sorry. There, there is no other kind of trouble to get into but the kind of trouble you get yourself into. Sorry. Or God always answers prayer, but sometimes he says no. That is the most despicable from the ninth circle of hell thinking <laughs> that ever existed. It totally defeats faith. If that's true, if God will make a promise and then sit back and decide on a case-by-case -case basis. See, we think he universally judges, but selectively blesses. When in fact, it's the other way around when he said, all of my promises are yes and amen. Mm -hmm. God universally blesses, and we could find scripture after scripture after scripture that says that, and then he selectively judges. Like the one scripture says, else you sons of Jacob would be consumed. If God just have has a blanket judgment sitting out there, there would be a lot fewer people walking around on this earth. Mm -hmm. But Christian philosophy, Christian culture flips it completely around. And so we add to the word of God. Just as wrongly as the person who would take the book of Jasher or the Gnostic Gospels of Thomas and insist they be included in the scripture. We have to take God's word as it is given to us without question. Oh, that's naive. There's no wisdom in that. I understand. It's foolishness. And we have to begin to tear down the babble of, of intellectualism and rationalism that is a part of our culture in the West and come back to the simplicity. Where's the miracles? Where's the unqualified faith? That begins with unqualified faith in his word. Our, our faith will never be refined to the point of producing miracles until our understanding. Faith is, the quality of your faith uh, is directly measured by your understanding and your commitment and your concept of the word of God. And if you have this muddled, watered down concept of God where we pick apart the scriptures and rationalize away the, uh, the statements of scripture, and then we wonder why the dead are not raised. We wonder why miracles don't come. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So we better be finding out what the word of God is and what our commitment is to it. And it's not rational. Oh, you're just not being rational. You're not being reasonable. Exactly. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Verse 11 through 20, please. There is a generation that curses their father and doth not bless their mother. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes, and yet is not washed from their filthiness. There is a generation, oh how lofty are their eyes, and their eyelids are lifted up. There is a generation whose teeth are as swords, and their jaw teeth as knives, to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. 
The horse leech hath two daughters, crying, Give, give. There are three things that are never satisfied, yea, four things say not. It is enough. The grave, the barren womb, the earth that is not filled with water, and the fire that hath that saith not, it is enough. The eye that mocketh at his father and despises to obey his mother, the ravens of the valley shall pick it out, and the young eagles shall eat it. There be three things which are too wonderful for me, yea, four which I know not. The way of an eagle in the air, the way of a serpent upon a rock, the way of a ship in the midst of a sea, and the way of a man with a maid. Hello. Such is the such is the way of an adulterous woman. She eateth and wipeth her mouth and saith, I have done no wickedness. Verse 11 talks about the generation that curses their father and does not bless their mother. The Verse 17 says, The eye that mocks his father and despises to obey his mother, the ravens of the valley shall pick it out and the young eagles shall eat it. Remember, that's almost a direct quote quoted in Revelation that says, Where the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered. And in the last days, Malachi says that the hearts of the fathers will be turned to the children and the children to the fathers and everybody else. The body of humanity outside that thinking becomes the carcass where the eagles gather. And what is the eye that's plucked out? That's what Jesus said, the blind lead the blind. How did the blind get blind? Because they mocked their fathers and they refused to obey their mothers. And we're not just talking about natural fathers or natural mothers. If your mom and dad are gone, go find you a papa. There are plenty of papas that have been mocked in the earth. There are plenty of spiritual moms and spiritual dads that have been mocked and despised by their own natural children, by their own spiritual children. Uh, we have a spiritual papa connected with our ministry that has been a, the, him and his wife. He and his wife have been a mom and a dad to men that are now mega church pastors. And if you ask them, oh, that's my spiritual dad, and they don't defer to them, they don't honor them, they don't bless them, and they have the audacity to call them their spiritual mom and their spiritual dad. And then they wonder why they get blindsided in life. It's because <clears throat> their I mocked their father and despised their mother and the ravens of the valley. What is the valley? That's whenever you get knocked down and you get down into a valley in life. Now, who's listening to me? And you get down into a place of difficulty, and you can't find your way out because the spiritual ravens have come and plucked your eye out, and you're groping and cannot see. I just can't see how. Let the Word of God discern the situation. And you can't solve the problem on the level of the problem. And that very person, you go back and begin to deal with them about that whole issue of the paternity of God, both with their natural parents and with their spiritual parents, and they will defy you and point their finger in your face. How dare you say that? I've had people say that. How dare you say I should honor my father? How dare you say, I, well, you don't know what he did, he did to me. He took the keys away from me when he bought me a Mustang and took it away when I went out and got drunk one night. He never gave it back to me. I'll never forgive him for that. And other things, not just natural parents, but spiritual parents as well. Yeah. <laughs> we done got personal. I understand that. It's in the book. You didn't write the book. <laughs> so verse 11, the generation. See, that's not only an individual. That's a generation. See, apostles are there. If God's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, there must be fathers, and it's the apostle. Yeah. And then the hearts of the children to the fathers. This is something that has to be dealt with. This is ground zero that has to be dealt with because there has to be fathers in the earth, and then there has to be children who are who are who have the paternity of God established in their life through those spiritual fathers, but natural fathers and parents as well. If there was ever a verse that so succinctly describes Western world, it's this verse about the generation that curses its father and does not bless its mother. See, our culture worships at the altar of youth. Unlike Eastern society that deeply venerates the elderly, we dismiss the elderly and we put them out of everyday life. I've heard, and spiritually, I've heard prophets say to Standing ovations. We need to quit talking about revival. 
We need to quit talking about what God did 100 years ago. Forget that. All that matters is what is God doing there. That's moving the ancient landmark. Mm -hmm. That's despising your father. You ask a young person today about, uh, do you know who Franklin Hall was? Do you know who William Branham was? Do you know who William Seymour was? Do you know who F.F. F. Bosworth was? And they have no clue. And we say, what's this world coming to? The problem is not just the younger generation who does not know. It's the older generation who has not stood up to be the moms and dads that God's called oh. them to be and to uh, marry the generations, to connect the generations so that we can have the compound anointing of the former and the latter rain mm -hmm. coming together. That's good, honey. Are you listening to me? Mm-hmm. See, we warehouse our elderly in institutions and retirement communities, and we bid them not to be too much of a burden or an imposition on our self-centered lifestyle. We consider the thinking of the elderly as outmoded. They start talking about what happened in the 70s and the 60s and the 50s, and we roll our eyes. We say, well, that's not relevant to the issues of the day. And God says that generation is cursed because they've not honored mother and father. Mm -hmm. As a young man, I saw tremendous things happen in business. God told me to go into business and I absolutely didn't have a head for business. People would look at how blessed I was and they'd say, oh, you're a good businessman. I'd laugh in their face because I was not a good businessman. I just simply learned how to hear God and it turned into money. <laughs> I learned how to hear God and do what he said. And I built a business that all of my competitors laughed when I opened a business in this little bitty podunk town, dried up little town of Windsor, Missouri. And uh, they laughed and said I wouldn't last a month. And guess what? I put them all out of business. And then a whole new crop of them came up and I put them out of business and a whole new crop came up. And in a three county area, I had the IT business that outlasted them all, but and is still going today. It doesn't belong to me. Uh, and not because I was such a good businessman, but because I listened to God and did what he said. Amen. And, but in the midst of that, I had this nagging thing like a little gnat buzzing around my head. I just knew there was some deeper blessing. There was something I knew that could cause me to walk in an exponential greater uh, calculus or metric of God's blessing that I wasn't seeing. And God gave me Exodus 20, 12. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God gives you. So you have to have a land before it can be blessed. Mm -hmm. So I had the land and I was seeing success. I was walking in success. I'd seen success as a pastor. I pastored, I pastored a, a robust church, a church of about, uh, at its height, about 320 people, 318 people. Uh, we had, uh, I'd been successful in ministry. I'd established myself, but I just knew. And then God moved me and put me to work for my denomination. And I was a number two guy in my denomination and was promoted over a bunch of other people. Who, who probably thought that job should have been theirs. And then God put me in business. He blessed me there. But I, I just knew that there was something else. And God began to speak to me. Honor your mother and honor your father. And so I began to seek the Lord about what that looked like. And for over 20 years, I gave consistent and concerted effort to bless and honor and defer to my mother and my father. And it just so happens my spiritual father, was my natural father and my spiritual father were the same person. I moved to a town where they had retired to be a help to them. I assisted my father in his business interests without pay. I deviated my plans and my personal pursuits. I put on hold in order to make myself available to them. I poured finances into my parents' lives, sometimes up to 70% of my income, in order to be a blessing to them. I understood that as the youngest son, I did not have the birthright of the eldest. And I was determined that if there was any blessing that could be deferred upon my head through a right and deferential relationship to my parents, I would make any sacrifice to pursue that agenda. You say, though, that doesn't apply to me. Jesus reproved 
those in the religious system of his day, he says, you are taking that by which your elderly, your parents could be profited, and you're giving it into the temple saying it is Korban, it is dedicated to the temple. I want to tell you that there is a dampening upon whatever you give into the gospel whenever your parents have needs. Come on now. Not everybody's parents have needs. I gave to my dad whenever I was struggling, when I didn't have $50 in my bank account, and he would take me down to the diner for a cup of coffee, and I never walked into the diner that I didn't hear somebody behind his back saying, you see that guy? He's the richest man in our town. Well, he wasn't the richest man, but he was certainly blessed. And here I am struggling to build a business, and God says, you pay every bill of his that you could conceivably pay. And I'm thinking, that's crazy, because I can't take care of myself. But I knew God was telling me to do it, and I made every effort. Here is the problem. My capacity to bless him was not as big as his capacity to bless me back. Mm -hmm. The big frustration in my life, I felt like him blessing me back was annulling uh, God blessing me because I was blessing him. And so I kept trying to usurp his blessing, his ability to bless me by blessing him bigger because I felt like he was undoing it. And he's like, look, you're messing with the plan, dad. <laughs> you know, but, he wasn't. but what, what was really happening is God was showing me what Amos 9.13 looks like when the plowman overtakes the reaper, Amen. where you're giving it all up for God. And the only reason you make it is because he's given it all back with a bigger bucket. God was teaching me what it's like to live under the kind of blessing that gets activated when you walk in these principles. And so uh, uh, I put aside what I wanted. I walked away from a successful career in the ministry. The number two man in my denomination uh, being groomed to take control of 350 churches here in the United States and 900 churches abroad. And I walked away from it to go and serve my father. I put aside what I wanted. I supported my father in choices that he made that were not my choices because my dad was from a different generation. He didn't think like I thought in everything. He got smarter as I got older. <laughs> when he would ask me what I thought about something, I didn't give him my opinion. I just echoed back to him what I knew he thought, even though it wasn't what I thought. And it was my honor and my privilege to do so. And when my mother and my father passed, I was not a son who tore his garments in sackcloth saying, if I'd only done this, or if I'd only done that, or if I would just told mama I loved her one more time. God gave me the, the absolute honor of being at my parents' bedside when they died. Amen. What a privilege. Wasn't fun. Wouldn't want to go through it again. Wouldn't trade it for nothing. To the best of my ability, I honored my mom and dad till their dying day and attended their bedside when they passed. And I pray that the dividend of those choices would be that my days would be long upon the land which the Lord God has given me. Of course, now you can observe. You can say, well, Russ, you had a good mom and dad and mine were not. Well, my first response is then go find one that is. Amen. Because I, I'm telling you this, the ink wasn't dry, if I could be say it just as strong as I can. The ink wasn't dry on my dad's death certificate when he laid somebody else, another papa, on my heart for me to go out and be a blessing and to go be out and sacrificially be a benefit toward. Amen. Does that mean I'm not giving to my church or not giving to, to, to the other? No, I'm doing that too. Mm -hmm. You cannot outgive God. But we wonder why some people say, I'm tithing, it's not working. You know, but your parents are on food stamps, barely getting by, living down at the project, the elderly projects, and you're giving tithe into the church and your parents are struggling. It's a dampening field upon your giving. Look, we need to begin to perceive these things. If you want to see an unlimbered blessing begin to come, a net breaking catch come Amen. into your life. Amen. <clears throat> So, well, my mom and dad were not good people. You don't honor your parents because they did everything right. My parents were godly people, but they were not infallible. They were not infallible. And they didn't always, not always, acknowledge the things that I did. You honor them. Here's how you honor them. Think about it. 
from Adam down to your mama's womb and your daddy's loins. They were the vessels through whom the breath of God came down through Adam to give you life. The breath of God mm -hmm. came to you through their DNA. You want to talk about the Holy Grail? You want to talk about the chalice of the divine through which you were birthed through your parents? Nobody is a mistake. Even those that are born of rape and incest are not an aberration or a mistake. Psalm 127 uh, verses 3 through 5 and many other scriptures say, regardless of the circumstances of your birth or childhood, God opens the womb and you are brought forth in life by his sovereignty. And from that standpoint, you seek the Father as to how and in what fashion you show honor to your parents. And if they're passed on, ask God to put a spiritual papa. Everybody should have a spiritual papa in your life. And you can't always pick them like they say you can't get above your raisins. You can't always pick them. But it's somebody, it's, it's a whole lot more than somebody that lives halfway across the country that you will never lay eyes on, you will never be in their presence. It's somebody who is an apostolic father who you can connect to in an accessible, genuine way. Somebody who's touching your life. Somebody who knows your name and can pray for you when they call your name. Amen. So well, what about giving? I'm not telling you not to tithe. I'm not telling you not to give to ministry. We give, and we give radically into ministry portion. We give to those that have blessed and shaped us. We give to those that are up and coming. We give where God tells us to give, but we do not forget to give to our spiritual papas. And you need to pray about that. Things are the way they are because of what you're doing. If you want to be blessed and to live a long life, you better be figuring out ways not to be a grief to your mother or a burden to your father and to make yourself a positive blessing. And trust me, um, not everybody's going to understand. Your siblings aren't going to get it. They will thumb their nose at you. They will roll their eyes. They will accuse you of being super spiritual. They will accuse you of pandering to your parents. They'll get mad at you when you receive the favor of your parents because of what you do. They'll get mad at you. They will mock you. You're even your spiritual uh, uh, kids. You may have a spiritual papa, and you'll see people that should have honored that person as a papa but aren't. They will become your worst enemies. Why? Because like one told me, you're in my way. You're standing in the place where, where God ordained me to stand. And I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, yeah, I'm absolutely right. And if you'd done your job, and if you'd done what God called you to do, I wouldn't be here. I've known my whole life. I'm not first string. I know my, God told me, he said, you're not my first choice. You're junior varsity, Russ. I have put you and I've placed you where other people refuse to go happily. Can I tell you? <laughs> I understand the whole Jacob thing. You know, Esau was firstborn, <laughs> but I'm going to offer him a bowl of beans. Go ahead, have your bowl of beans. I'm after that birthright. <laughs> Help us, Lord. Verse 23, 21 through the end of the chapter. For three things the earth is disquieted, and for four which can, it cannot bear. For a servant when he reigneth, and a fool when he's filled with meat, for an odious woman when she is married, and a handmaiden that is heir to her mistress. There be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. The ants are people, a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat for the summer. The conies are but a feeble folk, yet they make their house. What's a cony? <laughs> <laughs> Some kind of wild animal like a, isn't it like a fox? I think it's a bird. Oh, it's a bird, I think not it's a, a bird of some kind. I will have to research it. Um, the conies are but a feeble folk. They come from Coney Island. <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> yet they make their houses in the rocks. The locusts have no king, yet they go forth, all of them, by bands. The spider taketh hold with her hands and is in king's palaces. There be three things which go well, yea, four are comely and going. A lion which is strongest among beasts, and turneth not away for any, a greyhound, and he, a he goat, and a king, against whom there is no rising up. If thou hast done foolishly in lifting up thyself, or if thou hast thought evil, 
lay thy hand upon thy mouth. Surely the churning of milk bringeth forth butter, and the wringing of the nose bringeth forth blood. So the forcing of wrath bringeth forth strife. Pushing people around. Mm -hmm. You ever get pushed around? <laughs> Verse 21 through 24 speaks of four things that disquiet the earth. A servant when he reigns, a fool when he's full of meat, an odious woman when she's married, a handmaiden when she's heir to her mistress. All four of these things speak of dishonorable persons who claim false glory to themselves in the midst of life circumstances. A servant that reigns is the person who says, when I'm in charge, things are going to be done my way. And you see the mess that they make when that happens. A fool full of meat makes the assertion that he's justified in his foolishness because he doesn't suffer lack. You could describe the entire cult of celebrity in Hollywood as those who insist that they're carriers of the wisdom of the earth because they're celebrities. An odious woman, the word odious means unpleasant or disagreeable. An odious woman is an unpleasant or disagreeable person. And a wife, such as this, often hides behind the security of her marriage while contributing much discord and strife and no one calls her into account for it because she's shielded by a husband who doesn't have the courage to correct her. A handmaid who's heir to her mistress speaks of a master-servant relationship or an accountability to relationship that's out of order because the subordinate takes unfair advantage of the emotional connections they have to those that are over them. The chapter continues by listing four things that are exceedingly wise. The ants who prepare for winter. And, uh, and the conies, birds, who build their nests in protective places. Allison says, her translation says, a rock badger. Well, there you go. Thanks, Allison. A locust who have no king, yet they're a formidable force. And all of these are things like the ants. You know, the ants aren't sitting around having to be told what to do. <laughs> See, there's something to be said for being that person. And I've always tried to be that uh, uh, whenever I've had opportunity to be a subordinate. Is there's people who will do what... Uh, they're told when you tell them. There's people who won't do what they're told when you tell them. And there's people who see what needs to be done and do it without asking. And he says, the ants are like that. The locusts, they don't have a king, but yet they're such a formidable force. The spider who builds his web constantly, he's just constantly building his web. And guess what? They're in king's houses. Like the guy that said, we play till I win. Like my daddy always said, you do what you can with what you have and stick with it. Mm -hmm. And guess what? We came from homelessness to a worldwide ministry, responding to more demand than we could possibly respond to. Why? Because we're the most, I tell people all the time. I instructed somebody just the other day. I said, well, if somebody says that, you just tell them, well, we're not the, the, the only people that do this. We're probably not the most anointed, the most gifted, the most empowered to do what we do. Don't ever make the assumption just because you're successful that you're good at what you do. I don't ever assume that, but one thing I do is I do what I can with what I have, and I stick with it. It's mm -hmm. like when I thought about it's going to take us eight years to get through the Bible, and the Lord said, did you have something else to do? <laughs> People say, oh, you work so hard. I don't have anything else to do. And let me tell you something. Anybody that knows me and my, my family, those that live under my roof, know I don't have a works mentality. I got nothing to prove to God. Mm -hmm. I know he loves me. I can sit on this couch and eat Hostess cupcakes and watch Star Trek for a week and God won't be mad at me. That's right. I might be mad at myself because of what I got to do when I get want to. done with that. <laughs> but I don't have a works. I'm not proving I am secure in God. I know he loves me. It's like Jennifer says, I know you spoil me. The difference is I appreciate it. Amen. <laughs> but Absolutely. I just know to stay consistent. The spider, you could build that web. Why does the spider have his web in king's houses? Because he won't quit building. Finally, Agur, the son of Jacker, which is Solomon under a pseudonym, he ends talking about four things that prosper in their way for us to learn through. A lion who will not deviate his path for any. That's what I mean when I say, don't listen to your critics. You think the lion is going to sit down and say, well, I'm really concerned about that them, that leopard over there. He he may not like what I'm doing, and maybe I better go talk to him and go talk to the tiger and say, what's that leopard saying about me? No, the lion basically just presumes it's my way or the highway. <laughs> He's the king. You are the king of your jungle. You ever look at your life? It's a jungle out there. 
Yeah, but you're the king of your jungle. You have jurisdiction. There is, in every life, there is a jurisdiction over which you are the king of the jungle. Mm -hmm. And you will not deviate your path. There is a place you don't yield. One of the four faces of the new creation man that's depicted in scripture is the face of the lion. And you need to learn when to turn the lion. Thing is, we're turning the face of a man to what we need to be turning the face of a lion to. Every one of us wears four faces. When we look at God, it's the face of the bullock, the sacrifice laid out before God. When you look at the, 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 at the coming king, it's the face of the eagle mounting up with wings as, as an eagle to meet the coming Christ. When you look at the world and you look at the principalities and powers around you, it's the face of a lion. Say, bring it on, baby. It's mm -hmm. on now. <laughs> So it's the eagle, the man, the eagle. When you look at your fellow man, you're the face of a man. You don't humble yourself to man, but you're not any better than any other man. You ever see somebody take the face of a lion toward people and start pushing people around? That's wrong. You need to have the face of a man, have that face to face. I'm not any better than anybody else, not any worse either. And some people get offended at that when you don't get what one of my mentors called the tuck head around them to defer to others. No, I don't get the tech. I don't see anywhere in my Bible it says to humble myself to man. Mm -hmm. I walk in humility before men, but I don't humble myself to man. Jesus did not join himself to man because he knew what was in man. I don't care how much lipstick you put on a pig. It's still a pig. And I don't care what you surround yourself with. We're, we all get out of bed one foot at a time, just like everybody else. And anybody who demands a deference from you that goes beyond the parameters of mutual human experience, you better be careful there. There's an insecurity there. There's something broken. There's something wrong there. And so you have one of the greatest revelations sitting at the IHOP missions mm -hmm. base, the 24-hour prayer uh, uh, thing that they do up there is God speaking to me about those four faces and how to have right relationship to those around you. And when you get that thing turned wrong and you start dealing with, for instance, you turn the face of the ox that not only needs to be turned to God as a servant and you turn it toward man, you become a people pleaser. You turn the face of a lion toward people, you become a, a, um, a detriment in people's life, trying to push people around and control people. You don't want to do that. Or you turn the face of an eagle and you take this lofty thing. I'm a member of the Deeper Life Club, so much more spiritual than you. No, I'm not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that one was free. <laughs> uh, the lion who does not deviate his path for any. I've had people say, you're just stubborn. No, I'm not. I'm just not responding to you. God told me to do something and he didn't tell me to ask your permission. That's right. And guess what? I'm raising up a generation of men and women who I'm giving permission to be the exact same way. There's a lot of people in leadership who've accomplished things who think like that, but they will absolutely crush anybody who thinks just like them. See, but I want to set you on fire to go do what God said do. I may not let you do it in my backyard. We see a lot of people, they think their mission field is where I've been plowing. And they don't want to go out and break ground like God called us to go break ground. And so they want to trawl through. No, that... Look, you take your take your plow and I got I got some acreage. I got lots of acreage and I need lots of help. Okay, mm -hmm. that's not what I'm saying. But there comes a point that some people are putting their faith on what belongs to somebody else. No, go out and find that bare ground. God gave us bare ground. And to this day, <laughs> we're running into rocks and stumps. Okay, God's got some bare ground for you Amen. to go break up. The greyhound who's fleet of foot, he's got one thing on his mind, that rabbit. <laughs> he's after one thing and nothing's going to stop him. The he goat who climbs, it's just his nature. The he goat, he's just going to climb. He sees that next rock and he's going to leap for it. He's going to jump for it. And the king who rules so wisely that none can gainsay. You're a king. You're a principality and a power. But then immediately after that, verse 32 warns us against getting lifted up in our own estimation or being tempted to be self-promoting. He says, if you're self-promoting, lay your hand on your mouth to save ourselves the folly of the effort. 
Hallelujah. Amen. Don't you love Proverbs? <laughs> and we're talking about the Proverbs 31 woman tomorrow. <laughs> so you ladies, you need to get ready to download this one, to put it on your husband's smartphone, take <laughs> notes, uh, get it get it put somewhere where your husband's going to get to hear this one because it's going to super bless you. We're going to talk about the Proverbs. There's, there's two women in Proverbs 31. We're going to talk about the Proverbs 31 woman tomorrow. Glory to God. We're excited about tomorrow. We're going to capture everything we have for today. Thank you, Father, for your word in Proverbs 30 today. Thank you for helping us to line ourselves out so we can see ourselves in the word. We want to be a reflection of you when we look back in the mirror, Father. We don't want to be a reflection of the earth, but of your life and your character, your very nature. So we thank you for your word, Father. Your word is truth and it's light and it's life, and it sustains us, and we worship you, and we give you praise and thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen.